Um, welcome everybody to, to uh, the afternoon session. <laughs> Lovely to be with you. Um, so I'm presenting a talk on the history of banking and solutions to debt -based fun the, the debt-based financial system. Um, there's much more detail than I'm going to be able to go in, into today in my book, which I've got copies of for sale over there if you wish. Um, I've also got another couple of books on different topics, but very much related. Um, so um, I just thought I'd mention that to begin with. So I'm going to speak for a roughly three quarters of an hour, and then um, there should be time for questions after that. Now, um, if you don't understand anything I'm saying, it doesn't, it doesn't quite, it hasn't quite cognitive, you know, gone quite in and uh, you don't quite understand it, then I'm happy for people to put up their hand at that point so I can explain it in a different way or whatever. Um, but if you've got any questions specifically, then please leave them till the end. Is that good? Lovely. So, uh, right, so here we go. So, I love this quote and it kind of sums everything up in a way. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. It's as simple as that. And I love that image. It's on the front cover of the book. You know, uh, we're, we're, it's, yeah, and look, just it's, it feels so alive and free and connected. So, again, another quote that kind of sums up the issue from the other side, which is what's going on <laughs> in, in, on this topic. Now, this is actually a quote from one of the founders of the privately run Bank of England in 1694. And, well, how did he make his money? Well, unsurprisingly, he made his money from the slave trade and pirateering and all of that sort of thing. And he said at that time, the Bank of England hath benefit of interest on all monies which it creates out of nothing. Sums it all up. The Bank of England hath benefit interest on all monies which it creates out of nothing. And here's a quote from Reginald McKenna in 1924. He was, he'd been a banker and he'd also been Chancellor of the Exchequer for a while. I'm afraid that the ordinary citizen will not like to be told that the banks can and do create and destroy money. And they who control the credit of a nation direct the policy of governments and hold in the hollow of their hands the destiny of the people. So there, it's a very stark warning to us all to be aware of what, what the reality is here. Now, I just at this stage, I'd just like to thank some people. It's always good to say I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here. Um, so m my first big thank you is to Justin Walker, who's my um, co-author of the book, and he's done a vast amount of research on this topic, much more than me, um, and we'll talk a little bit about his story later. Um, James Corbett of the Corbett Report, some of you may know, he's a fantastic independent journalist, just so spot on in my view. Uh, John Hamer, who's become a personal friend, which I'm very um, happy about, and he's the author of the massive tomes, like each one's about this thick, um, the two volume, Behind the Curtain, A Chilling Expose of the Banking Industry. Um, now also, is a uh, I'd like to thank the makers of the Money Masters documentary, which was produced in 1996. It's still out there, it's re you know, you can find the link in my book. It's, it's about four hours long, and my God, if you don't know anything about the money system, by the end of that, you surely will. Um, it's, yeah, brilliant. Um, Charles Eisenstein, who is the author of Sacred Economics, and I'm going to refer to him later, and just generally friends and family for their support. So I'd like to give you an overview, just to so see we can set the scene. So the overview is that money is created out of thin air by private central bankers, and then loaned to nations at interest. So this is what national debt is all about. That's how com that comes about. It's how inflation comes about. It's, a, it's largely how unemployment comes about. And essentially what's going on is that the world's wealth is being siphoned off the whole time 
to a small number of greedy, power-hungry individuals, most of whom are in the shadows. We don't see them on the news. We don't see them on the telly. We kind of vaguely know who they are, um, and you might have an idea. It doesn't really matter who they are. But anyway, this is the basis of the slave system we're in, in my view. Um, so another aspect to this is what's called fractional reserve banking. And essentially this means, you know, this is our direct situation here. When we're taking out a loan, which, you know, we're, most people have got, or a lot of people have got a mortgage. Um, so you might think, oh, well, the bank's got that money in its, in its vaults and it's going to lend it to me and I have to pay it back. And No, 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 no. <laughs> It's just a, an accounting fraud. Basically, that it conjures up this money out of nothing, gives it to you, and, and then you have to pay it back at interest. I mean, that's just a complete fraud. And at the, at the moment, we now have this move towards a cashless society, which I'm, all sure, you're, yep, I'm sure you're all probably aware of, um, where we're going to get what's called central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs, and, of course, it's going to be called the digital pound in this country. And that's going to result in bankers having total control over our lives. We'll delve into that a bit more. We're going to look into how the City of London is the real power behind the UK Parliament. And it's not us, the voters, or whoever's voting. I don't vote, but it's not the people voting. No, those in charge are the ones in the City of London and, and beyond that. Uh, we're also going to talk... Uh, and that's particularly what this book covers, which isn't really covered. Um, what makes this unique is it doesn't cover this story, which Justin has researched and knows a lot about. Um, uh, sorry, books, <laughs> similar books on the money system don't cover this story. So this, this is what this makes this book unique in that regard. Um, and it's the story of how the UK Treasury issued sovereign money in 1914 and that was nicknamed the Bradbury Pound to avert economic crisis, taking the printing and control of money in Britain out of the hands of private bankers for the first time since the creation of the Bank of England in 1694. And surprise, surprise, that's now been airbrushed out of history, that whole episode. Um, well, what happens when you have sovereign money, when it's UK Treasury issued money, debt-free, interest-free money, then... Uh, it's not rocket science to say, well, that leads to prosperity, peace, cultural enrichment, full employment and zero inflation. And the Bradbury Pounds showed that. So bringing back, you know, a new Bradbury Pound would bring about these positive benefits once again for us and generally in, the, in, in, our, you know, in our world. I, I'm also going to talk about, briefly, um, decentralised solutions. Um, so that's where we're not having um, an overarching um, governing authority issuing sovereign money, but we're kind of really, it's more grassroots based. It's what we're doing in, our, in our, ourselves, in our local relationships. Um, uh, and that's barter. Is, you know, one, one easy way of doing that is having precious metals and trading with them. Um, and then truly decentralised and democratic cryptocurrencies, because they aren't, I mean, uh, I'm not an expert on cryptocurrencies at all, but in my understanding, there are certainly some of them that aren't truly decentralised and democratic, so we want that type. Uh, and local exchange trading schemes are good as well. Um, uh, but and, uh, uh, along with all of that, and this is my big passion ultimately, is moving towards a moneyless society based on generosity, at least within our close-knit community. There's no one solution, though. We could have a whole basket of things. Um, and this is really, the decentralised solutions particularly, are within the context of creating a parallel society where we're getting off the mainstream systems as much as possible and we're doing it ourselves. So we're not invested in the slave system as much as possible. That's growing our own food, producing our own electricity, um, and finding means of exchange beyond the debt-based money system. Um, just for, to give you some examples. So this is my sort of call, if you like, general uh, rousing thing. 
Um, let's break the shackles of the slave system we're in, take back our power and come together in love and open, open heartedness to be the guardians, stewards of an abundant, thriving, beautiful earth. It's all up to us guys. It's, there's no saviours out there. We have to manifest that in our lives and in our communities. So, Justin, my co-author, Justin Walker, what's his story? Because it's very relevant. Um, his uncle, who was known as Lord Pilkington, um, attended the first Bilderberg Group meeting in 1954. You may know, of, some of you may know about the Bilderberg Group. Um, and he was a director of the Bank of England from 55 to 72. Um, now, Justin himself, um, he, in 1978, he joined the Ecology Party, which later became the Green Party. He served on the party council for 10 years, being a passionate environmentalist. But he left the party in 1992, um, feeling that the real truth about everything wasn't being told in that. Uh, you know, it had lost, that the Green Party had lost its um, eth ethos and gone astray, so he left. Um, in relation to the money system, now his uncle, years ago, had already told him that the City of London actually controlled Parliament, so he kind of had an idea of that. Um, but uh, something else came along, and he had what he called his Richard Hannay moment in 2012. So he gets this mysterious phone call from somebody saying he's the son of somebody who served as a director the Bank of England with his uncle um, and it, this man, this old man is dying and he wants to pass on something to Justin, information that's been deliberately kept secret from the British people and that quite simply it would be the big secret <coughs> that would be the solution to all Britain's economic woes. And all Justin was told was the word Bradbury, he said it was told research Bradbury and then the phone went dead. <laughs> and Justin said, Bradbury? Bradbury? What's all that about? So we started researching, you know, went down lots of bl uh, blind alleys. But eventually, he came across the Bradbury Pound. And this is what we're going to look at later. I've already mentioned it a little bit. Um, and then, f subsequent to that, he did 10 years of extensive research on this topic, including talking to insiders. So, as I say... Uh, I'm so grateful to have produced the book with him because he's done a, a vast amount of research in this area. So what is the debt-based money system? Let's just break it down. Um, how the money system works is deliberately obscured. We're, it's all smoke and mirrors, essentially, and we're kept in the dark as to who gets to print money, the basis of the financial system, and of course that leads on to political power. So if you ask anybody in the street, they have this vague idea, if you ask them, well, w what's the Bank of England? Well, it, they think it's some part of, somehow part of the government or part of the state, that it's a, a body that serves the people. Well, no, it's a private institution with private shareholders who we don't know because it's set up by Royal Charter and we, we don't know who these shareholders are. They have secret meetings, they're unaccountable, they're not elected. And guess what? It's a profit-making institution. So it's there to make profit for the shareholders. It's not there to serve the people. So what do they do? They have a system to make them profit and money, which is based on debt, and it's all owed to them. And as I've said already, the UK national debt, currently £2.5 trillion, is owed to the private bankers. So even if you think, oh, well, I've paid off my mortgage and I've, I haven't got any credit card bills, you know, don't owe any, any money. Well, actually you do. <laughs> Every man, woman and child is in debt to the private bankers. And that debt is forever increasing. And this situation exists because this private institution prints money out of nothing. Come back to the William Patterson quote, which it lends to the government at interest. So the UK isn't a sovereign nation because it doesn't print its own money, along with virtually all the other countries in the world, most of which have privately owned central banks. You name it, um, 
there's very few, and usually they're considered rogue states, like North Korea and Iran. Now, I'm not saying they're fantastic regimes, no, but the reason why they're really kind of portrayed as like these nasty, nasty people is because they're showing, actually, you don't have to have a, a, a privately owned central bank that's robbing you all the time. So the bankers don't create wealth, they take wealth. And here's uh, Mater Amschel Rothschilds, uh, who you may have heard of, founder of the Rothschild banking dynasty in 1790. Give me control of a nation's money and I care not who makes the laws. So it gives them political power as well. They're able to buy and, you know, they're able to buy politicians, no problem. Um, and so we're all hostages to these people and they have complete control over our e the economic life. Um, so I, I don't want to um, denigrate money as it, as it, you know, as a simple means of exchange, but we've got usury, which used to be, you know, the, the church used to say, you know, that's unethical. Um, well, they, they don't say that anymore, do they? Um, charging interest on money. You know, money then, when money becomes a commodity, that's when the problems start. Uh, and profit can be made from money, which should be just literally a means of exchange. And then we've got fractional reserve banking, where banks lend out far in excess of their reserves, which I've just mentioned. Um, they, they offer more money than they have and they charge interest on it. It's another way that money is created. Um, the, this is the commercial banks, by the way. So you've got the central bank and you've got the commercial banks. So the bankers are leeches, as I say, constantly siphoning um, wealth out of the real economy into their pockets. This is how inflation comes about. This is how the cycles of boom and bust come about. It's not that they're, you know, whoa, you know, with it's some natural cycle that has to happen in the economy. No, it happens because of the debt-based system, and I'll talk a bit about more. Talk a bit more about that later. So here's a couple of quotes. Um, don't just believe me. Maybe listen to these guys as well. James Madison, who was a, a U.S. president, 1809. His, history records that the money changers, i.e. the bankers, have used every form of abuse, intrigue, deceit and violent means possible to maintain their control over governments by controlling money and its issuance. And if you look back in, in US history, you'll see president after president giving sort of similar quotes, the Money Masters documentary documentary is fantastic, laying, out, laying that all out. And Henry Ford, well you may know, you know, founder of the Ford Motor, Motor Company, um, US business, business magnate. It is well enough that people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary, monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. There you go. So, time for a revolution, guys. <laughs> well, what does this all lead to in the world? Well, I think we, we, we know, really. The, there's, the, you know, just for an example, there was a report by Oxfam in 2020. The world's 2,000 billionaires have more wealth than 4.6 billion people who make up 60% of the world's population. That's what happens. It's just massive discrepancy. Um, and just to confirm this Im immoral situation, there's just two private asset management companies, BlackRock and Vanguard, that control and own virtually all of the major corporations on Earth. So the centralized centralization of, of wealth and power and control, therefore, is massive. And, of course... You know, alongside that, well, just there's millions of children, for example. There's lots of examples we could pick from what's going on in the world. But just say, you know, there's millions of children, you know, working in sweatshops in China or wherever, scrounging for discarded items on rubbish tips to help their impoverished and disempowered parents. This should not be happening in the world. 
So we're going to have a little bit of humour along the way. We have to, don't we? Um, commemorative plates. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and, you know, I d it's not just a dig against the, 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 the monarchy, but I have to say that is part of it. Um, <laughs> massive part of it. Um, so the City of London's grip on Parliament, well, what's a key part of that? A key part of that is something virtually nobody knows about. It's a person called the City Remembrancer. Put your hand up if you've heard of the City Remembrancer. We've had four people, five, four or five people. Okay, well, I didn't know about the City Remembrancer until 2021, until I read about it in the light paper. There's some copies of, the recent copies of that over there. What is the City Remembrancer? This is a guy appointed by the City of London. He sits, and it's normally a bloke, of course, he sits behind the Speaker. He's an unelected, unaccountable person who sits, oh, well, he's accountable to the City of London, not to you and me. He sits behind the Speaker, and he's there to ensure that all the legislation going through Parliament is in accord with what the City of London wants. And, it, you know, if there's something going through that the City of London isn't happy with, I'm sure he goes and has conversations and he twists arms or whatever, you know. Um, that's what goes on. And that, you know, all this debt-based system, it leads to this contrived boom and bust cycle. So if the bankers want to create a boom, then they put more money into the system, they extend lending, like in the Roaring, roaring Twenties, this is a classic time. So the Roaring Twenties happened, they, they, you know, and then people go out and because the, the economy is booming, there's real assets and resources are created and accumulated. So there's real wealth created, right, from this paper money that's being circulating and, and the loans that are being put out. And then the bankers say, right, ready, let's reel it all in. And then they manufacture a crash, which is the Great Depression, is the classic example. The, Ro the Wall Street crash started off. They contract the money supply all of a sudden. They call in the loans. Um, people can't pay off the debts with the, with, the, with, the, with the paper money. So what do they do? They have to hand over their real assets and resources to the bankers. So the classic example for you and me would be that our, we can't pay our mortgage and our house is repossessed. Well, that's the real wealth. The real wealth is the house, not this paper money which actually wor is worthless. Oops, why is it not going? Oh, it's the, the computer's thinking about it. <laughs> oh, it's frozen. What do I do? Help. <laughs> Um, oh, hang on a sec. Oh, it's working again now. Um, I know what, yeah, right. I just needed to click. <laughs> um, and something else that nobody, or, or virtually nobody knows about, the Bank for International Settlements, or the BIS. Hands up if you know about that. Oh, a little bit more people know about the BIS. Wow, I'm impressed. Well done. <laughs> so you may well therefore know that the the Bank for International Settlements is at the top of the financial pyramid. The folk working there, they have, or whatever they're, whatever they're doing there, they have diplomatic immunity, they're exempt from paying taxes, it's a private institution and held in total secrecy and unaccountable. So it's, it, it, one way of describing it is that it's the, cent it's the central bank of all central banks. So the, the wealth that's created for the central, each individual central bank, like the Bank of England, then flows to the Bank of International Settlements, based in Baal in Switzerland. Who was it set up by? It was set up in the 1930s by the governor of the Bank of England, a guy called Montague Norman, and a guy who became Hitler's Minister of Finance, I can't remember his name because it's German. <laughs> I need a German to help me out on that one. Um, and uh, lo and behold, the Bank of International Settlements was operating during the Second World War. It had British people working in there, it had Americans, it had Germans, 
It had, you know, it had people from both sides supposedly fighting each other, but no, they were working, you know, together because the what 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 were they doing? They were making money out of war. War is a vastly profit-making enterprise. So the the private bankers are constantly bringing about wars because that's when people go massively into nations go massively into debt. They ma the bankers make lots of money from arms sales, and um, and all of that sort of business goes on. There's much more to it than that, but that's a key aspect. Now, there was a guy called Professor Carol Quigley, who in 1966 wrote a book, classic book really, in this in this sphere, called Tragedy and Hope: A History of the World in Our Time. And he'd actually managed to gain the trust of the central bankers, uh, attended some of their most secretive meetings. So this is a rare situation for somebody who then became a whistleblower. Um, and um, this is one of the quotes of his book. The powers of financial capitalism had a far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of private control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalist manner by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was the Bank for International Settlements, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks which were themselves private corporations. The growth of financial ca capitalism made possible a centralisation of world economic control and use of this power for the direct benefit of financiers and the indirect injury of all other economic groups. It's a good sum summation. Well, now what's going on, I've already referred to it, we've got these CBDCs, digital currencies coming in. What does that mean? Well, it's programmable money. It means AI can follow you. Everything you're doing, AI will be following you. And if you step out of line, then uh, you'll get penalised. So a classic example might be if you haven't had your latest vaccination, well, you won't be able to spend your money until you do. Or if, the, if, the, if you've been a bad boy or bad girl politically, again, you won't have access to your money, or maybe you'll only spend, be able to spend so much money on certain things, or be able to only spend your money in certain places, whatever they want, yeah? And, well, Augustin Carstens, who's head of the BIS, he summed it all up in this quote, and you can actually see a recording of him saying this. It's like, it's all out there in the open if you, if you, if you go and look for it. This, this is what he said. There is a huge difference, and he's talking about between digital currencies and cash. For example, with cash, we don't know who's using a $100 bill today. It's anonymous, yeah? We don't know who's using a 1,000 peso bill today. A key difference with the CBDC is the central bank will have absolute control, absolute control under rules and regulations that will determine the use of that expression of central bank liability. In other words, your money, supposedly, they have total control over that, and we will have the technology to enforce that. Yeah, the AI and so on. Well, let's just go back again, another US president, found, you know, founding father of um, America, Thomas Jefferson, what did he say? If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people for whom it properly belongs. So I'm just going to take a slurp of water at this stage.
Good. <clears throat> oh, not more, more humour. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. we may think we have a free press. Do we really have a free press? Well, it's all corporate controlled. <clears throat> well, let's come to the Bradbury Pound. I've bigged it up, haven't I? So let's tell you what actually happened. So in 1914, war is about to come about. Now this is something the central bankers have engineered to, to come about. They want it to happen. And as I've said, war, they need, you know, war is the most profitable thing. They, you know, central bankers want war frequently. And we've had plenty of them. And it's not just to make money, there's geopolitical aims, there's to traumatise the people. Lots of, lots of reasons to have that, but the first and foremost is profit making. Now at this stage, the British people were aware that we we're on the verge of war and they were getting really jittery. And at that point, the paper money, the Bank of I England issued notes, I promised to pay the bearer on demand, the sum of well, it's, w what's that promise to pay back? It's promised to pay back. In this case, it's the, th the currency supposedly is backed by gold. So people are getting jittery. They want the real gold. They don't want these paper money, these, you know, bits of nothing. Um, they they want to make have security. So people start queuing up in droves outside the banks to exchange their paper notes for the gold. But, of course, there's been a ruse going on there isn't enough gold in reserves to cover all the paper money that's been put into circulation. So the central bankers are getting nervous because they see that there could be a run on the banks and a collapse of the economy. And they don't want, they often do want that and they contrive it, but they don't want it at this stage because they want a smooth transition into the war. So what do they do? They go to the, the, the government, the UK government, um, and uh, Lloyd George was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, as I said, politicians are just at the beck and call of these guys. That's the reality, in my view. Um, and they said, right, what we'd like you to do is issue treasury money, put it out to the economy, um, and uh, so we can, you know, we can avert this crisis. The government says, yes. So for the next three to four months, they issue UK treasury money, debt-free, interest-free money, it became known as the Bradbury Pound because Sir John Bradbury, who was Permanent Secretary of the Treasury at the time, his signature was on it, so that's how it became known as the Bradbury Pound. And it wasn't backed by gold, but it was backed by the credit, wealth and creativity of the nation. So we might say the GDP, for example, we might call it that. So in other words, there was enough money put into circulation to facilitate trade, between people, keep the economy going, but without too much that it creates inflation or without too little that this trade and this economy can't happen. And I don't know quite how it happened, but the people accepted this, that the banks were shut for about three to four days. There was an extended bank holiday. These notes were printed, the Bradbury Pound. And then when people came back to queue at the banks when they were open again, they said, well, we're not going to give you gold, but we'll give you these other, these new notes, the Bradbury Pound, which they accepted. And then they started, for, you know, went out into the, into the economy. And lo and behold, as I said earlier, what does this create? Debt-free interest free money, creates stability, it creates prosperity, zero inflation and full employment. Um, so after a little while, the bankers... <laughs> We've, now we're getting jittery about this UK Treasury money. And they said, well, OK, I know, we want to make money from this war. So they went back to the government and said, OK, stop issuing those notes. We want to transition now back into this, the Bank of England notes. So that happened over a period of time. But there were still Bradbury pounds in circulation right, as, right up to 1926. And Justin himself actually has a Bradbury pound. Uh, very proudly he displays it often and there's pictures of it in here um, and it goes into more detail in this, into the story there and has lots of pictures um, so and now it's been airbrushed out of history because it's very inconvenient to the central bankers because <coughs> it shows it's so simple it's such a simple solution just 
cut the cord with a with a private central bank, and let's just issue our own money. I mean, it's, it's it's obvious, isn't it? When you know when you know about it. And another example of sovereign money, which is probably the most famous one, but there was a number of them in in, in America, was in the eighteen sixties. President Lincoln issued what became known as the greenback dollar. Um, because he went to the bankers and said, well, I want to pay for this war. And they said, well, we'll loan you money at this vastly exorbitant interest. And he said, oh, sod that. <laughs> um, I'm just going to print my own money. And he called it the Green Mac doll. It was, it was it's massively popular. And the central bankers had a problem stamping it out. In fact, I think there were still Green Mac dollars in circulation right up until the early 1990s, believe it or not. It paid for the Union's victory in the Civil War. And then, oh, even this guy who did all of this, oh, he just happened to get assassinated. I wonder why that was. Um, so a restored Bradbury pound, it's simple, effective, it's proven. We can see that from the history. Um, it being about a massive and positive transformation of the whole of our society. Continuous stability and prosperity, rather than this contrived boom and bust, um, and you know, which often then triggers austerity, which is what we're going through now, and these inflationary and deflationary pressures. And of course, that leads to stress and worry amongst people, um, and particularly amongst the poorest and most vulnerable. And you know, why do we have food banks? Just a little thing, why do we have food banks? It's all because of this robbery that's going on all the time. Um, so let's kick out this, this greed this, this you know, greedy situation, this criminality. Um, and let's, you know, that's just all sorts of amazing things are going to happen. Selfless entrepreneurs, inventors, and people of real vision and ability, um, you know, just want to make life, people's lives better. Um, well, you know, rather make, in making a, f well, you know, fair enough, they want a fair and reasonable return for themselves. But, you know, it's also about, Let's not abuse the earth in all of this. It's going to be, it's, you know, the whole diff there's whole as many different aspects to this. Um, yeah, th the only proviso, and Justin's very clear, and there is a big proviso about this, about the sovereign money solution, is that you're, you need some sort of central authority, it might be nationwide or it might be regional, that actually is there as servants of the people. So they're wanting to do something for our benefit. And unfortunately at the moment, as I've said, our parliament isn't set up like that. So it is a big proviso. And actually, this is why I think, I think you know, it's, it, the um, sovereign money solution is, it has a lot to say for it because it, it's, it would create a system that everybody's familiar with. We're all familiar with, you know, pounds and, and, and notes and, and, you know, uh, digits in our bank account. So there would be no difference from that. You know, cryptocurrencies for a lot of people are too, like me, are just too complicated or challenging to understand. Um, but having said all of that, my big thing really is let's just do things from the grassroots up. That means decentralised solutions. And Buckminster Fuller, um, I love this quote, you may well have heard of it, it's a very classic quote, but it's so true. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So it's that parallel society thing, let's just get on and do it ourselves. And then it'll attract, because that brings about community, it brings about love, it brings about connection, it brings about more, you know, less stress, um, and people get attracted towards that. Um, so yes, this parallel society, creating local systems, building resilience alongside the existing mainstream systems. So we're not fighting the mainstream systems, we're just saying, well, we're just, we're not going to take part in that as much as we can. Um, so this is a, from a place of empowerment. We're not coming from a place of fear. And we're, we're creating a thriving society out of this. So let's just look at a few options. And I'm not going to go into these at all in great detail. And there's more covered in this in the book. And there's lots of 
links if you want to go do further research. Um, but the, 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 this is all predicated, decentralized solutions, or you know, the basis of that, the foundation is your community. So it, there needs to be a community. And you can find that, for example, through looking at, there's a, there's a UK-based freedom network, and you, see, you can see, you can find your local hub, and you can connect with the people there. But basically, it's the people in your local area. You know these people. And it's so easy to start this. It, it's not difficult. You know, just having potluck evenings, for example, where people all bring a dish, you get together in a hall like this, you share food, and you start chatting and making relationships. That's how it can start. It's as simple as that. Yeah? And then when it comes to, well, how do we have means of exchange? Well, you know, I have a book. If anybody's got something of similar value, I'm happy to exchange it with them if I, that's something I want, and I do that quite often. I'd rather do that than actually have money, really. Um, again, it's about relationships, and, and, and I benefit by some, having somebody else's product that they put their love into and care. Um, well, precious metals are great because it's out of the debt-based money system. They retain their value, as somebody was talking about earlier. Um, for me, it's great because it's a physical thing that I can have in my hand rather than the cryptocurrency, which is on a computer and that I don't understand. But some people are really into cryptocurrencies. Great. If that's their scene, I'm really up for that. Um, but as I said earlier, we want decentralised, community-driven cryptocurrencies. And a good example of this is uh, one called Cortal, um, which you can find out details of in the book. And um, local exchange trading schemes. So this is where you have tokens, and it can be set up in many different ways. So if I go and do a presentation like this, I'm given so many tokens, and then I can go and I can have a massage, and you know. So you're, it's, it's, and I get, and I, and I use some of my tokens to, to you know, to that for that massage. So again, it's just stepping out of the mainstream system. It's not barter because you've got tokens which um, uh, are being used. So you, you don't have to find th if you're doing if if. I'm giving a talk to Belle. She doesn't have to give me something that I want. She gives me the tokens and I find somebody else who's got something I want. Um, but actually, I'd come to Belle for food because her food's <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a quote from uh, Sean Stone, who's the son of Oliver Stone, who you may, re may recall. Um, and he's doing stuff in the world now. He said, we want to be interfacing and interacting with, with folk we know and with whom ideally we have mutual understanding and principles rather than contracting with people who are pirates and scoundrels such as banks. What gives them the right to create money? I also have the right to issue my own currency. Uh, so there's currently a paradigm shift happening with finance and economics which we can all become a part of. So that's my encouragement to you. My books are all about s empowerment. Yeah, I have to say, well, this is the rubbish going on in the world. The world is bonkers. It's, you know, disconnection, there's separation, there's greed. But the positive thing is, hey, this is a time for massive positive transformation. And we're here to be the pioneers of that, in my view. Those of us that are willing to engage, we have to engage. And... As I said at the in, in the overview section earlier, um, my ultimate passion is what's called the gift economy or a moneyless society. This is really going back to how humans existed for the vast majority of our time on this planet. You know, how long have we had money? Well, you could say, well, from the Roman times, maybe, or maybe a bit before that, maybe the Sumerians started wrote money, but we before that we were, you know, we were just in communities, we we're in tribes, we we're and, and even people are living like this today still, where it's all based on gift. Um, and this little quote, you know, we've all been given a gift, the gift of life. What we do with our lives is our gift back. So these are societal systems that operate um, 
uh, through exchanging gifts. And the gift is a voluntary transfer of goods or services, not without any obligation for somebody to give me something back in return. Everybody has a gift. Could be knowledge, could be skills, could be services, could be commodities. It could be playing some music, could be cooking some food. And if that's shared, it could rapidly solve a pressing need elsewhere. Well, Bell makes some wonderful food. We're all hungry and we're, we're satisfied, aren't we? People and organisations get their problems solved or they solve other problems. So we're actually born into a gift economy. You know, it's practised by those who mother us. That's how we are able to be brought up. Um, so this economy ex of exchange, although I'm not, I don't want to completely denigrate it by any manner of means, but the quid pro quo, it does lead to us separating from each other on the whole, not always, but on the whole, and makes us more adversarial in competition. Now obviously this is bigged up massively with the debt-based money system. Um, but essentially that's, it has that flavour to it. So, but actually giving gifts and receiving gifts, it creates mutuality and trust. It creates relationships. It creates community. And that's the basis of everything, as I said before. And it can lead to peace and abundance. And we all feel happier. When somebody gives you a gift and you weren't expecting it, and it's just such a beautiful gift and it comes from the heart, and you think, wow, it just lifts your life, doesn't it? We've all experienced that. And we've all experienced giving gifts. And, 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 and giving gifts also does, it's the same thing. You feel so uplifted that you've given something to somebody and their face is lit up, you know. So the, the main two elements of a gift economy are generosity and gratitude. When I'm feeling abundant, I can, feel, I can be generous with my abundance. I don't want to hoard it. It's all mine. No. Not yours, mine. No, I want to say, I want to share this with you. And then when I'm in a place of scarcity, people will say, oh, I can see you're in need. Here, have some of mine. I've got plenty. Um, and some of the poorest people will be like this. They'll always have something to give. And how, how do I feel then? I feel grateful. I feel part of something. I feel part of a community. So, as I say, this is the thing I'm most passionate about in all of this. And this is a little thing that I wrote, just to sum that all up. Real wealth. Money isn't wealth. Possessions aren't wealth. Reputation isn't wealth. Real wealth is vibrant health. Real wealth is family. Real wealth is community. Real wealth is an abundant, thriving earth. Wealth is the gifts you have given. Wealth is the strength of your connections in the web of life. So I hope that's landed well with you. Percy Bysshe Shelley, wow, this is a stirring call to, I wouldn't say call to arms, but call to empowerment really. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. You always remember that. Ye are many, they are few. All we need to do, that we're, so, we're living in a disempowered world, all we need to do is take back our power and that centralised power will just shrivel away of its own accord. We don't have to fight it. We don't have to kill them. It'll just shrivel and die. And we'll embrace. It's about embracing everybody. No, no, nobody is beyond redemption, in my view. It's about bringing everybody in. We're all sacred beings on this earth. I'm not saying there aren't consequences to... There are consequences to people abusing others, for sure. But ultimately, you know, we need to find love, connection and even forgiveness. So, something that just puts that in visual representation. Um, and just last thing I'm going to say before we go into questions, and I'm bang on time, which is amazing. Um, <laughs> concluding remarks. So it's time to see through this sophisticated deception, which actually you can explain to anybody on the street in about two or three minutes. This is what I love about this topic. It's just 
you know, the money system is the centre of the spider's web. Once you understand how we're being complete, there's, there's this contrick and fraud going on right underneath our noses the whole time, but it's obscured by smoke and mirrors. Oh, the Bank of England somehow part of the government. Well, no, well, as soon as you know it's a private institution, boom, 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 boom. And you're given the quote by William Patterson, the co-founder of the Bank of England. Oh, oh my God, it doesn't take much. And people are curious about this because they know, they know they're being shafted. So it's a great way to speak to people out there. It's a great way in. And then once you understand about the money system, everything else falls much more easily into place. The other aspects of how we're being controlled and manipulated and so on. Anyway, so let's see through this sophisticated deception. Reclaim our power and sovereignty. Reconnect with ourselves, with others and with nature to create a truly magnificent world. It's all there for us if we want to step into it, yeah? So I just want to thank Bob Moran for the couple of cartoons I put in there. <laughs> and there's his website, he's, he's, yeah, brilliant cartoons. Go and check him out if you like. And there's my contact details. Uh, I've got a website um, and you can order, I mean, obviously you can buy books now or people can order books through my website. You can see um, to, uh, uh, recordings of some of my presentations and podcasts. And, you know, feel free to contact me as well and give me any feedback. I'm really up for that. And, uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> lovely, lovely. So I can put the... I believe so. Yeah, I believe I'm going to go into I'm going till about quarter two. So we've got just over ten minutes. So any questions? Oh, sorry. What's your opinion on Brits? Oh, that's yes. Um, well, um, I've been following. Yeah, Brits. Would you know what it stands for? Um, India, China, China, somebody else. Um, it's supposedly well. What I would say is, if you want to know about BRICS, and I'm just going to give a quick overview, and certainly it's not something I've done a vast amount of research into, but if you want to know about BRICS, go and check out the work of James Corbett. Um, as I've said, the Corbett Report, because he's, he's really hot on this. And a lot of people in the alternative sphere are saying, well, BRICS, isn't it great what's happening there? They're kind of giving a sort of, uh, what's the word, two fingers up to the you know, the, uh, the existing centralised authorities and they're saying, we're going to do it differently in our countries and sod you. Well, actually, when you start looking into it, what do these people want? They want digital currency, they want all the same things. And who was involved? Well, they recently had a conference. Who was their spokesperson? It was a certain guy and James Corbett talks about this. Then you go on the World Economic Forum website, you look at the f and you find his name there. So it's all interlinked, it's all interlinked. Um, now I'm not saying it's completely black and white, and it, you know, things like this often aren't completely black and white. It's a, it's a bit like, you know, what, what's the relationship between the West and China, or the West and Russia? Well, you could say, well, Putin, do you know that Putin um, was uh, groomed by Kissinger and by Klaus Schwab, the head of the World Economic Forum, and he was really good mates with both of them. He went, you know, he was one of the young global leaders. He went on their program with the uh, World Economic Forum, like a lot of people, like um, Macron, like Tony Blair, like um, um, what's that German president, a female president called? Merkel. Um, you know, all these different people, along with a lot of heads of corporations and so on, have gone through that. Pre well, Putin did too. But... You know, he also likes to be his own man and his strong man. So, you know, there's black and white. There's, there's nuance to all of this. It's not just black and white. Um, but, uh, yeah, but essentially, I would, I would, I, I'm not the best person to ask on that. But that's my quick overview. And I'd certainly g suggest going to um, the Corbett Report and, re and searching for bricks. And you'll get stuff on that for more detail. Yes? Just to say the other day I was in a lecture about um, banking and crypto Corbett. Yes. He was saying... Sorry, uh, uh, the guy who was giving the lecture. The energy that is used to run the computers, the crypto coin, are based up in Norway. 
and then use the same amount of energy as Ireland. These things are uh, they're computing with this cryptocurrency vast numbers per minute, and they use the same amount of, of energy as Ireland. It does not surprise me. I mean, already what's going on is that there's vast warehouses full of computers with petabytes of information that have to have huge ventilation systems because the, the heat that's generated from all these computers is vast. Well, uh, yeah, but, I, but, it, it, but prior to all of that, it's going on anyway because what they're doing is they're already tracking all of us. We're all being tracked, we're all under surveillance and your digital, you know, your digital phone is all, you know, it's your, it's your tracking system. Um, and what they're doing, well, one of the things they're doing is they're seeing what your preferences are, what you like, what you, where you go shopping, da 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 da, so they can target advertising at you. So you, you're into golf, you go and play golf, you'll get all this stuff at, you know thrown at your way about oh get the latest golf club or the get latest golf ball yeah so that's already going on in that sphere well it's no surprise that of course when digital currencies come in that's just even more so so um yes i've got two questions if it's possible one is the bradbury pound yes um and you were talking about <coughs> starting in 1914 beginning of first world war yes is that is that because the war was coming Absolutely, it was because the war was coming. Well, as I say, th these were circulate. There is within circulation. There were Bradbury pounds in circulation right up to 1926. But essentially, it was about a couple of years, really, where there was a lot of them in circulation, and gradually they were they were they were they were taken out of the economy, and it was replaced with the 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 Bank of England notes again by which time everybody was in the flow of war and they wanted to support the country and, and they were distracted by all their, you know, sons and, and fathers and, 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 and husbands going off and getting killed, you know. So by that stage, they weren't thinking, you know, so much about the financial system. So it was much more easy to bring that system back in. So the second question is... Yes. What you're saying, I appreciate what you're saying, and kind of try to live that way from since the 70s, 80s, because I'm of that era. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. So if, if the logical conclusion, what we're talking about, is that we live in community and do things with each other, without the financial uh, system, how are people going to pay for their houses, rent or mortgage? How is that going to happen? All we're saying that doesn't exist. How do we stop? Well, th there's... there's th many many degrees to this okay as I said a very simple step to begin with which is just building community you can stay completely within the mainstream systems but build community so that when the shit is the fan and believe you me it will shit hit the fan you've already built those relationships there's a feeling of mutuality and trust so that you're going to be much more willing to help each other out we're not all living in our separate boxes and our separate worlds so much, yeah? Um, so that's the first thing. But, yeah, we all have to find, you know, unfortunately, we are in a situation where it is very difficult to extract yourself from mainstream systems, at least completely. So, we, again, it's like, well, I can have an allotment or I can grow it in my garden or I can, you know, I can find my local farmers and support them rather than buying from supermarkets. You know, so there's many, many ways of going about this. But, you know, some people say, well, I'm going to completely extract myself. I'm going to go and live in Costa Rica. I'm going to buy a small hole. You know, people do it in all sorts of different ways. And some people really go for it. I'm going to, you know, get away from this altogether. And I was just hearing earlier from a friend who gave me a lift here. You know, there's a guy living down at the bottom of Cornwall who's, you know, living off a lot of the wild foods, the seaweeds and other things, and um, he does without money, he doesn't have a phone, as, you know, he do, well, does without money as much as possible. So, yeah, it's really what feels right for you. I'm not saying it has to be done this way, or you should, or you must. No, I'm not, I'm not at all trying to, 
um, convert people to any particular way of going about it. You do what feels right for you, and you have to be comfortable about it. Um, but yeah, I think the security, ultimately, it comes from not having money in the bank. It comes from that community and from ha relationships. Yes? Yeah. No, no, sorry, the chap behind. Yeah, next. <laughs> I would just like to share an observation as well. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Beautiful. Um, I'm also struck by how we've been manipulated for generations. And that manipulation has been possible because of the fear agenda. So I just would like to add, we have to step away from fear. Mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. totally yes. To yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I do a number of presentations now. Coming at all of this, really, I come to the same stage, but from different angles. So I come through the biology and medicine state, you know, um, way in. Um, and I come in also through the, the environmental stroke climate change way in, but I'm all coming to this place. So just to say, in my, I, I really go massively into that in my bioterrain medicine talk, breaking, you know, breaking that shackles, and there's another Bob Moran lovely cartoon where the shackles are breaking in the, in the, and it's spelling the word fear. So you're breaking that shackle of fear because I totally agree with you, yes. That's a key aspect to it. Yes? Yeah, um, do you, how did you follow Michael Challenger at all? I, yes, I do know, yes, yes. Got like a whole thing on one small channel. Yes. That people can look up um, because he's already yes. eating those towns. Yes. Well, the thing is that we're all creative, imaginative people. And what we want to do is we want to release that creativity and imagination. And there's no one size fits all. There's no one solution here. It's what is right for you. Now, um, Michael Challenger, as you say, has got this whole um, uh, small town, one is it? Small town. One small town way of going about how you can, how you can um, configure. I don't know what the right, quite why the, but you can, you know, within your, it has to be a, a town of a certain size. Get hold and of the, the mayor of the town. Yes. So then they, I mean, I don't know because I haven't, updated myself recently but it was that you get get everybody off the town off grid mm -hmm. they put investors in to start with mm -hmm. and everybody's off grid and then you have to grow three lots of food and it's all about the working with everybody yes some hours. yes yes the people that make he's saying it's not we don't need money because it's the people who do the work now i think it was uh, i'd come across the work of mike and tellinger but from a different aspect and i think it was actually bell or no, it was Eli. Was it Eli? Somebody, somebody um, who put me on to what he's doing on that front, which I wasn't aware of. I don't actually think, unfortunately, it's referenced in my resources section yet um, because I produced the book just before I knew about that. But if I had known about it at the time, I would have put it in. Yeah, so if, that, if, that, if you're drawn to trying that out, if you, do, you know, that's a great way in. So go with what feels, as I say, there's no one, for, for me it doesn't feel, no, that's the way I want to go personally, but that's fine. Or you can, you know, you can, you, c you can take inspiration from that, maybe you can take elements from that and adapt it to what's going on in your, you know, lots of different ways here. We are creative, imaginative people. Do what's right for you in your own life and in your community. Um, so any other questions? Well, uh, probably one last question if there's time for. If there are any, but maybe there aren't, so that's fine. What yes. Does the government have over the banks? Do they have any? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <laughs> well, as I say, Tony Blair, what was he? He was a um, young global leader, you know, Macron, um, Merkel, the, 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 all these different people. They're all part of the system. They're all um, what you might call career politicians. That's another way of describing it. This is all laid out in the book. Don't go, you know, you look in here. <laughs> um, and it, it, it certainly lays that out. Justin's very strong on this. Um, you know, and he talks also about Caroline Lucas, who most people think is wonderful, but, you know, you might not. Um, uh, Francis O'Grady, who had been the head of the TUC, the Trades Union Congress, you'd think they'd be all for the people. Well, she's, a, you know, she's a non-executive director of the Bank of England. Oh, 
Oh, well, who's she, who's she co- doing, you know, uh, the bidding of? Um, it's all... Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, when you've got so much wealth and control, when you assassinate people, let's face it, President Lincoln, and when you... Uh, it goes beyond that. When you blackmail people, when you get dirt on them, and you, you can go down some awful rabbit holes on that front, then you can... You know, they're just at your bidding, really. So, and unfortunately, even Jeremy Corbett, who a lot of people, again, it's mentioned in the book, but even Jeremy Corbyn, and I'm not saying this is at all black and white, because there was a lot that he was bringing forth that was really brilliant, but um, he had, when he was out of power, he was very happy to say, yeah, let's have a new Bradbury Pound, as soon as he was trying to, you know, he was the leader of the Labour Party or whatever he was, and he was trying to um, get, in, you know, form a government, no, he quietly shelved that. And Justin was saying, look, Bradbury Pound, Bradbury Pound. And he wouldn't, en- he wouldn't engage anymore because he didn't want to upset the central bankers. So he didn't have the guts. He did not have the guts to say, mm. actually, this is the, s- the, the, the nub of everything. <laughs> this is where everything comes from. If we're not dealing with this, yeah, it's the same with Donald Trump. People say, oh, Donald Trump was the saviour, he did all these things. N- well, was he challenging the money system? How did he make his business empire? It's all based on the, on the banking system. He was, a, he was a slave, you know, he was a servant of the banking system. He wasn't going to challenge the, the, the debt-based money system. So, in my view, we need to get rid of all of them and just do it ourselves, Yeah. Let's forget all about that bollocks. It's time for a new paradigm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well,